Good morning. I'm Reverend Rose, the Minister of Smooch. It's a joy to see you and an honor to be broadcast into your homes from our beautiful community garden here at Smooch. If you are new to Smooch and want to know more about our church, please fill out a get to know you form or just say hi in the chat right now. Whoever you are, whoever you love, and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Unitarian Universalist congregations affirm and promote seven principles, which we hold as strong values and moral guides. The first, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The second, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. The third, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. The fourth, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. The fifth, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. The sixth, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And the seventh, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Just a few announcements to begin. Next week is the Water Communion. And because we can't be together like we'd like, we are going to do the next best thing. So this Tuesday, September 1st, from 4 to 6, we invite you to come to church in your car and drive up to a bowl of water that will be outside. Get out of your car with your little mask on and pour your water in. This can be water from anywhere your faucet, the saline river, a bottle, and I will film you doing it and then show it to the world at the church kickoff service, September 6th. Now, as we prepare ourselves for virtual worship, we are planning on several different types of services this fall. Every other week, we will be having a live streamed service and the weeks in between, I will film myself, weather permitting, in a special liturgically interesting spot that will lend some interest to your worship experience. With me now are six people who are here behind the camera to make sure that I don't go crazy preaching into the phone. This is going to be going on for a little while. And so we invite you to make use of our church's beautiful 17 acres of grounds, knowing that this place from where I am preaching has been blessed by the joy and work of this beloved community of which you are a part. And if you are interested in becoming part of this community and want to learn more about Unitarian Universalism, please join us for our Just the Basics class. It will be held on the second Tuesday of every month virtually. And lastly, if you are a young adult ages 18 to 35, please look in the weekly email or the church Facebook page for a link to the young adults group. It meets every Tuesday. Together, we are better. Together, we are a courageous church. Together, we are a courageous earth. <laughs> Ours is no caravan ever to 
is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with one another. Welcome to your rainbow altar time! Even though we can't come to church right now, we can support our own spiritual practices by creating sacred space around us. This is a practice for the kiddos of all ages. We encourage you to use a small surface in your space to place precious objects, such as your at-home chalice, photos of your loved ones, or meaningful quotes. An altar allows you to create a peaceful spot and can aid in your sense of safety and belonging in your space. It doesn't have to take up much room and is just a thing of meaning and beauty. It is a reminder that we are still a congregational community and it's something that we can all do together even though we are apart. Each week, we, as an intergenerational community, are invited to work on our own personal altars together. As the weeks go by, we will add a different color of the rainbow to aid you in your spiritual practice. The rainbow represents the diversity, resilience, and beauty of this world. And so we add the color purple to our rainbow altar. You can write a quote you love in a purple marker or cut out a shape from a bright purple piece of paper. You can put a purple object or put a purple piece of cloth on there. The color purple symbolizes not only royalty, yes queen, but also outer space, diving into the depths and immersing yourself in the stuff of life. As you add to your rainbow altar with the color purple, you can ask yourself, could I be kinder to myself, treating myself like the queen or king or royal that I am? What do I love most about myself and how can I put myself first and represent this on my altar? What's a well wish or prayer I have for myself? I could write that down. Or what's something scary you've been trying to dive into and how could you support yourself using this altar? This is the time in our service where we expand the love of our community, where we draw to heart and mind those in our midst who are suffering and those who feel the sweet relief of their burdens easing. Let us draw into our hearts all for whom life has been dramatically changed over the course of the last six months. We draw the children into our hearts, their parents and grandparents, and their teachers. For all the families for whom life is so different, we embrace you in our beloved community. Know that we are with you and we are eager to support. We give our love to those untangling themselves from relationships that no longer serve them. We grieve for the loss of energy and time that chronic illness takes on the body. And our hearts go out to all who are struggling to make ends meet, especially during this pandemic. 
We extend our gratitude to people who make caring for children their primary spiritual practice. And we join in wonder with all who are bravely facing their final days. And as always, we rejoice over the exquisite beauty in this world, as small or life-changing as each piece of beauty might be. Okay, let us become mindful once more. I invite you to put your feet flat on the floor. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. As we are in the garden, and all of us, no matter where we are, are seated on this earth, let us ground down. You can close your eyes. Continuing to breathe deeply. Notice where your body touches the earth. And allow yourself to feel not only your body pressing down, but also your body lifting up. Now I invite you to take your hands and you can put them palm down on your legs or if you're somewhere that is near the earth, put them on the earth. Wherever you are, find a way to put your hands on something living. Take a moment to feel your hands, notice what they are touching. Notice if you have pain. Notice if your hands are peaceful or restless. And then wherever you are, wherever your hands are, send a silent blessing to whatever you are touching. Send your love and your commitment to life itself. Blessed be and amen. Our reading today comes from Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of the book, Braiding Sweetgrass. She is a writer, a plant scientist, and a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. 
The Potawatomi were lakeshore canoe peoples from northern Michigan who were forcibly removed and brought to Shawnee Mission and afterwards were once more forced to walk to Oklahoma. In honor of her writing, and before I do this reading, let us orient ourselves to this history of this land and remind ourselves that this very place is Ka and Osage land. It was not owned as we think of land as owned, but stewarded by these people who may have employed such wisdoms in their land ethic from which we can learn much. Wall Kimmerer says, people often ask me what one thing I would recommend to restore relationship between the land and the people. My answer is always plant a garden. It's good for the health of the earth and it's good for the health of the people. A garden is a nursery for nurturing connection, the soil for cultivation of practical reverence, and its power goes far beyond the garden gate. Once you develop a relationship with a little patch of earth, it becomes a seed itself. Something essential happens in a vegetable garden. It's a place where if you can't say, I love you out loud, you can say it with a seed and the land will reciprocate in beans. It has been said that gardening is the slowest performance art. And indeed, there is quite a performance going on around us. There is such beauty bursting forth, so alive that in fact, sitting here in the garden, I have to say that it feels like the seven of us who are scattered out amongst the plots are actually surrounded by a host of the wildest, most gorgeous artists some bearing gifts unimaginable. For example, we are accompanied by our friends, the bean plants with their long finger-like selves. We are held by the heart-shaped strawberry, chaperoned by the watchful eye of the tomatoes, our sanctuary adorned by fountains of basil, It changes you to be in a garden. It cracks you up a little bit, puts things into perspective, reminds you of something profound. Like when I sit amongst a big, beautifully tended to and functioning organic garden like this one, which has borne thousands of pounds of produce and made hundreds of meals that otherwise would not have been meals at all but empty bowls. When I sit in a garden like this one, I almost forget about how scarce the world can seem. It feeds the soul to know that humans and the land can work in concert like this to make such a work of art and service. We need this knowledge now because indeed there is a cloud hanging over our heads. We live in a world right now colored by knowledge of loss of life, the threat of disease, the impending election on which lives and global health are balanced. And for now, we must continue with this socially distant time where there are no hugs at church on Sunday morning, no kids hiding under tables in the fellowship hall, no singing together as one voice, no ritual. And many of us are feeling bereft, wrung dry, without that sense of fullness and peace and pleasure that comes from being with 
our beloved community. But here's something for you that I think might do you some good. In her book, Robin Wall Kimmerer offers us a wonderment about the possibility of bending our understanding of the natural world to think that it may not be quite so separate from us, but rather in concert with us that the inherent worth and dignity of every person could actually refer to the plants, the air, the stones, the waterways, the animals too. Indeed, she suggests that when we love the land, that it actually can love us back. That if you can't say, I love you out loud, you can say it in seeds and that the land will reciprocate in beans. And it's that relationship between the natural world and humans that I want to focus on today because I think that much of the pain that we feel right now is actually an old pain that we are only now awakening to. And this is the deep spiritual angst angst of disconnection from the land. You see, the Western religious canon has taught us that our role as humans is domination and subduing of the natural world. But here we are in 2020 with some major issues regarding humanity and land use. Indeed, the great texts have been used to justify a hierarchy among Earth's beings, namely humans at the top and these beautiful friends and artists and givers, these friends of ours, the plants, the air, the animals, stones, and even the water that gives us life down at the bottom. As Wal Kimmerer puts it, indigenous languages life ways and relations with the land have all been subject to the violence of colonialism. Mays herself has been a victim and so have you. When a worldview which cultivated honorable relations with the living earth has been overwritten with an ethic of exploitation, when our plant and animal relatives no longer look upon us with honor, but turn their faces away. But there is a kernel of resurgence if we are willing to learn. There is an invitation to decolonize, rematriate, and renew the honorable harvest, which extends beyond indigenous nations to everyone who eats. Yes, it's not much use to dwell on how we got here or to lament that we haven't been sitting at the feet of plants for decades with that innate knowledge. Instead, I think we would be better off if we worked to uncover some of this ancient knowledge, these ancient land ethics, to find that mutually beneficial relationships between human, humans and the land is possible. Because what if with gratitude and presence, we could be in right relationship with the land. What if we did get ourselves free? What if we did get our people free from the loneliness of not loving the land like a friend, like our mother, like all of its beings have inherent worth and dignity? So let us turn today to an ancient theology for which land use is the very beating heart of not just spiritual connection, but also service, justice, and community. More importantly, it's an ideology about where we come from, about our very bones, our very origins, who our family is, and where we belong. This is a theology where the earth is like a silken screen through which all other aspects of life must pass. The sieve which only lets through practices and ideas that keep the earth at the beating heart of it all. 
Now I'm going to tell you a story written by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And while I like to retell and reweave stories because of the history of white people, such as myself, minimizing the voice and wisdom of native peoples, I am going to read her creation myth word for word as is adapted from oral tradition and Shenandoah and George. She tells the story of the sky woman. In the beginning, there was the sky world. Sky woman fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear, or maybe in hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at that sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust moat in a beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled towards them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, loons, otters, swans, beavers, fishes of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gradually, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far and after a long while he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one the other animals offered help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were all too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon, only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downwards and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human. But then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by this extraordinary gift of the animal, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks from the dab of mud on Turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not by Sky Woman alone. 
but from the alchemy of all the animal's gifts coupled with her deep gratitude. Together they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. But like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were branches, fruits and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed from the hole in the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees and medicines spread everywhere. And now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on Turtle Island. That is the origin story, but there is one small addendum that I think is particularly beautiful. Many years later, Sky Woman's beautiful daughter, whom she carried with her in her womb from the sky world, grew on the good green earth, loving and loved by all other beings. But tragedy befell her when she died giving birth to twins, Flint and Sapling. Heartbroken, Sky Woman buried her beloved daughter in the earth. But the daughter's final gifts, our most revered plants, grew from her body, and the strawberry arose from her heart. In Potawatomi, the strawberry is called the heartberry. So grateful to be able to reflect on this origin myth. Now, what if we understood our own bodies to be like the bodies of these plants. Each of us born from a seed with innate knowledge of how to expand and grow into what we have become. Each of us with gifts and offerings and beauty and flavor of our own. Wal Kimmerer says, what I came to understand is that traditional knowledge of plants was so much bigger, so much richer than the scientific worldview would allow because it brought in not only that which we can observe, which is empirical, but it also brought in history and story and spiritual teachings and mind, body, emotion, and spirit. She says, so I came to understand that this was a much bigger and more powerful way of knowing that creates a different framework for living in the world. It's not just about information and data, it's about wisdom. And so I encourage you to think like this too. Just as a friend's voice or company can soothe you as you drink your chamomile tea in the evening, consider the information and wisdom that you receive into your whole being from this tea, which is a familiar agent of calm, relaxation, sleep. But what if you also considered it a friend who gave its life for you as a gift or as an artist's performance working in real time. In your isolation and loneliness, who is to say that the air is not with you, that the waterways have not chosen to stay? For even a patch of grass in a prison yard holds within it the source of life spreading and rooting, a gift of green that speaks and sings to you of the joys and miracle of creation. And thus, we as a church work this land, this abundance, this plot that we are currently stewards of, and we are doing it so, so lovingly. We have 17 acres of beautiful, well-managed, well-loved outdoor spaces at this church. And it is our deepest prayer that you will come and deepen your connection to nature here at your church, if only to come and say hello to the plants, 
thank them for what they've done and breathe the air that they clean for us. Feel that warmth of the sun. Taste the uniqueness of their flavors. Run their leaves between your fingers. For our healing comes from within. Our willingness to change how we relate to the land comes when we see the land as friends. Blessed be and amen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.
closing, I want to just mention that this garden has a very special ethic. For this is not just food that is grown for us to feast upon. No, most of this food is given away as freely as the earth gives us food as gifts. For your church has not laid fallow during this public health crisis and shut down. No, this community has burst into life, blossomed alongside the spring flowers, transforming a wing of our church into a food pantry that this garden supplies with fresh, lovingly grown vegetables. Like the strawberry heart grown from the body, we invite you to come and lay your hands on this soil. Bless us and bless these plants, acknowledging their inherent worth and, dig worth and dignity and yours as well in the process. To see their uniqueness and beauty and yours as well. We want you to come and participate, come and watch this grand work of art, our community garden. If you are new to Smooch and want to know more about our church, please fill out the Get to Know You form using the link in the video description. And please stick around after the service for online fellowship hour. The link is in the weekly email. out there.